All right. Welcome, Come everybody. Oh, my goodness. You guys are so prompt. I see. Hi, Peter Van. Hi, Sam. Hi, Richard. Charles. Hey, Judy. Peter Kaminsky. Bill. Judith. So great to see all you guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're also very punctual. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we going? I'm Peter Van. We never met, but I, I've admired you and checked out your stuff for some years. So it's great to connect here. Thank you. Thank you. I've got to keep my eye on the participant room, so I'll be admitting people for a little bit here. Awesome. Well, I turned on the recording, so we're recording with me to the cloud. The cloud. Jerry, and your microphone, I think your microphone is um, acting up a little bit. Is it me? Okay, let me switch yeah. around. Maybe a cable. Okay. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Lauren. How are you? Welcome. We're just getting started here. Hi again, Sam. Do you hear me now? Yes, Jerry, yes. you sound great. Okay, good. I was using my really good microphone, which was screwing up. So I'm on the earbuds now. How about that? Sometimes <clears throat> low, te low tech. Is Lessons we learn. Here. Yes. <laughs> I see Lena. Lena, hi. How are you? Nice to see you. Hi, Ann. Hello, April. Hey, Philip. Hey, how's it going, buddy? Hey. Hello, hello. Yay. Good to see you, man. And I see Mike is on as well, at least from an audio. Hi, Ann. Charles, you said hello. I may say hello to you three times as I make as I make a list of who's in the room here. <laughs> Shay is coming in, but her uh, her Zoom is updating, so she'll be with us in a sec. Fantastic. Eating a little, so I'll go off camera for until needed. <laughs> Richard, awesome. <clears throat> Richard is in Hong Kong and usually sports a TARDIS. Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I've gone with John Oliver today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yay. This is lovely. Hey, Lauren, who's your company? My daughters who are playing the piano, so I will mute myself. Awesome. <laughs> perfect. The little background music never. No, it's perfect. Better. It's some thinking music. Angel, good to see you. So I'm at a disadvantage because I don't know all of you. I see D. Howard. Is it? Yes. What's your. Hi, my name is David Howard. I'm a David. friend of yes, friend of Mr. Sai is over there. Hey, David, it's great to have you here. Welcome. I'm Thank Hamilton. Thank you. Hi, Hamilton. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. We'll do introductions in just a second. Uh, hi, Mike. And Mike, you have a you have someone with you. One of you is Mike. Yes. I won't presume who is it. Who I'm is. Mike. <laughs> That's Olga. <laughs> hi, Olga. Mike and Olga. Hi. Mike Peeler. I've heard yes. so much about you, and I've never ever I've heard so much. I feel like we've met. <laughs> Let's go into a breakout room and talk about Matt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So Jerry, you think we're you think we have quorum here? Is there is there somebody you know? I think so. I, I think there's in? probably another five six people who might join, but we might as well uh, dive in. That's fantastic. Cool. Hey Ken, Ken I feel so misled. You have you have a clean face on Facebook, but uh, I, I don't even recognize you. It's great to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got tired. I figured that no one cares, so I'm not shaving. I haven't had a haircut in three months, so it's just, I'm letting it all go. Oh, the same. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm aiming for Bjorn Borg, but it's going to take a while. <laughs> hey, hey. Real, real quick, hey, can you send Chris the Zoom information? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. We may have a, scry a graphic facilitator join us and start taking some visual notes for us. So awesome. uh, yeah, it'll be great. So guys, uh, thank you so much for being here. We are so excited. We were just had a pre-call and, and we were so giddy that we almost forgot to let you in. But Jerry, of course, remembered and was prompt. Um, I'm Hamilton. 
uh, I'm going to sort of be moderating today, but really just a name only. I really want to try to be framing a great conversation with all of you guys. Um, so here's what we're going to do. I want to do some intros. And actually, you know, generally when we do virtual intros or intros in a session, we sort of breeze through them because we know that there'll be more talking. But I really want to spend some time because we're really proud to have this group of people together. Uh, and and you're, you've been picked for for because you're great and you bring a lot to the table. So we want to get to know everybody who's in the room. Uh, so we'll do that and then we'll get into it and we'll do a little bit of a background about why we're here and what we're talking about. I'll frame the big questions that we're going to grapple with today uh, and we'll just dive into it and we'll sort of roll around in them and then we'll end the call about where do we go from here and, and what role could you play if you wanted to and, and being a part of this going forward. So that's what we're going to do and I'm going to sort of, it's, I find it easier if I'm very prescriptive in the introductions. So let me say, here's first of all what I'd like to know. I'd like to know who you are. I think we know that. Uh, why are you here? And that means who do you know? What brought you to this call? Was it Jerry? Was it Matt? Was it something else? Um, where are you dialing in from? And then the last thing, uh, what's your superpower? You all have one. Sometimes it's just you got to remember what it is. Not related to anything, but coming from you. What is your strength? What is your superpower? Okay. And so... Uh, I think I've got everybody's names here. I'm going to be doing it, but let me just tell you how I'd like to do it. I'm just going to run down the names so you sort of know where you are on the list. Peter Kaminsky, Bill Seitz, Charles, Peter Van, Richard, Judith, Sam, Kevin, Lauren, Lena, Ann, Mike and Olga, David, Angel, um, and April, and then Ken. I'm going to make sure I, if I forgot you, I'll make sure I didn't, but that's the order we're going to go in. So I'll do who's up next, who's on deck. So we're gonna give everybody 60 seconds if you want, but let's start, Peter Kaminsky. You're on deck, Bill Seitz, you're next. Who are you, where you're from, why are you here, and what's your superpower? Hi, I'm Peter Kaminsky. I'm uh, here because of Jerry. Uh, Jerry and I go way back. Um, I'm calling in from San Diego, and uh, my superpower is probably, I. Um, a longer story but maybe being sensitive uh, and and perceptive and being able to make connections awesome thanks peter and superpowers are also super weaknesses of course <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> that was implied um excellent all right so bill sites you'll go next and charles you're on deck Great. I'm Bill Seitz. I am living in the exurbs of chicago in exile from new york city I've known Jerry for 20 plus years, um, and I'm here because I am a junkie for open collaboration, uh, growing from individuals to small groups, and I've been a wiki junkie for 20 plus years, and probably my superpower is uh, hyper-pragmatism for software-specific plans in terms of who can actually, what can you actually get done with minimum resources and maximum adoption. Awesome. I want to introduce a term that Jerry, something that Jerry taught us is when instead of applauding or anything like this, you can do a little, it looks like jazz hands if you see your wrists, so just keep it below or do jazz hands. There's nothing yeah. wrong with jazz hands. This means I agree with what's being said. This means I disagree with what's being said. It's totally <laughs> legit. And if you're yeah. in gallery view, it really, really works in Zoom. Hopefully you're not doing that too. The, there's none of this through the introductions, Jerry, but I'll leave that to you. Okay. Uh, Charles, you're up next. Peter Van, you're on deck. Charles. Thank you. Um, it's really delightful to be here and an honor, in, in fact. Um, I'm co-founder of Collective Intelligence Collaboratory, along with Lauren Lignon, who's here, and um, Network Weaver and Interoperability Freak. I'm here because of Jerry Mikowski and um, your greatness, Jerry, and uh, your call to action. I'm present and accounted for. I'm dialing in from Zurich, Switzerland. And if I had to pick one superpower, and I was digging and I didn't grab it in time because um, I was sh short up on the list here, there was a, a Twitter thread exactly about this where I found myself um, challenged to give one because there's kind of a list, but I picked one for now and it's interoperability flow. Thank you. Nice. Thanks, Charles. That's great. Okay, Peter Van and then Richard, you're on deck. I'm Peter Van. I know Jerry. I know Ham. I know a couple of other people here in this group. I'm calling in from uh, Flanders and my superpower is uh, 
creating artistic interventions and interruptions. Peter, great to have you here. Okay, Richard and then Judith, you'll go after Richard. Hi, um, my name is Richard. I teach leadership um, from Macquarie Business School's Global MBA and I run a community of disruptive thinkers based out of Hong Kong. Uh, I might start fading at some point because it is 11 o'clock at night here. <laughs> um, I'm here because I know Jerry, although we've only recently met through a, a contact in Australia and my superpower is my sense of irony. Okay, that one. That's great. Thanks, Richard. All right, Judith, you're up and then Sam, you'll be next. Hi, I'm Judy. I'm from Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I'm here because I met Jerry about 15 years ago and participated in Yitan and some other things. Love integration of thoughts and my superpower probably is connections and integrations of somewhat disconnected things. Great. Thanks, Judy. Appreciate that. All right, Sam, you're up and then Kevin, you'll be next. Hey, well, uh uh, as many of you are, I also am a uh, acquaintance of Jerry's, although much more recent than most of you. I think it was only like six, maybe five years ago. Feels like more um, than that. I go way back. Was it that? Anyway. I, I don't know. Feels like more than that. I'd have to check. Well, you know, we first met in 2008, but then we kind of didn't stay uh, in connection. But then, you know, I went to your uh, retreat, I think maybe seven, eight. Then we each dated different people and finally we met again in a coffee shop and things just went off from there. Sorry, Sam, go ahead. My power, uh, I should say my uh, super low power is my uh, lack of memory, okay? Hence my <laughs> desire to push everything into external repositories. And that's why I'm so enamored with the brain and with workflow and you know dynamic knowledge repositories, etc. Let me go through this really quickly. I think uh, I found it and I'm an amateur in this field I call collaborology, which is uh, the successful scaling of uh, collaboration. And so in it, I've got a tongue in cheek list of what I call smart people problems, which I'd love to share at some point. Um, I'm also uh, a Doug Engelbart disciple wannabe. So I've embraced in uh, really trying to extend his ideas and visions. So among them is an idea called the community of impact, which I've kind of recruited a few of you into. Uh, one of my superpowers is not quitting. So I promised Doug that I would not quit to try and bring his reality, his vision to reality. So I've uh, maintained that ever since uh, 2008. And a couple other things, uh, I'm an ex-lisper, so current closurian for those of you who know what that means. And I used to uh, be a co-chair of the Silicon Valley Engineering Leadership Council for about 11 years and still am, you know, when I'm in the Bay Area. And uh, my day gig is I'm at eGain, which is a Sunnyvale company. And my title there used to be VP of Engineering, but now I'm a technology evangelist. It took a while to sort of get to that title. Over. Sorry to be so long. That's great, Sam. No, fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. That's awesome. All Hi, right, everybody. Kevin, you're up. And Lauren, you're next. Uh, Kevin Gangle, founder of Unstoppable Conversations, uh, dialing in from Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, I'm here because Jerry said, uh, come to this thing. So I'm looking forward uh, to what I came to. And uh, my superpower is to work with a, with a group um, who's up to big stuff and take the invisible context, which is uh, running the show, make it visible and tangible so they can actually uh, do something about it. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. All right, Lauren, you're going next. And then Lena, you'll be after her. Okay, yeah, I'm uh, Lauren Nignon. I'm American, but I live in Paris. And, um, you know, I hate to just copy Judy, but <laughs> I would say that connections and integrations of disconnected things is also my thing. <laughs> so thank you, Judy. And I'm also from Minneapolis, so. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, Minnesota. Oh, just like Paris. Um, great. Thank you. So, um, Sorry, that joke fell a little flat there. Nothing against either city. I love them both. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, Lena, you're next. And then Anne, we'll hear from you after Lena. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lena Ravindran Green. I'm actually a Singaporean, but I'm living here in Cupertino, California. That's where I'm dialing in from. 
Uh, I run an angel investment network that invests into women and indigenous led social enterprises that are tackling poverty, gender equality, and responsible production and consumption. It's called Angels of yeah. Impact. And I'm on this call because I know Jerry and I know him actually quite recently through the EXO network when we were at the EXO summit. Um, and my superpower is usually taking very complicated um, ideas and kind of simplifying it and helping to use that to connect people. Awesome. Thanks, Lina. Okay, Anne, you're up and then Mike and Olga, you guys are on deck. Hi, I'm Ann Pendleton Julian. I'm uh, calling in from Los Angeles, where it's absolutely glorious at the mm -hmm. moment. Uh, I'm an architect, started out practicing architecture, actually started out in astrophysics, uh, do everything from houses to universities to systems and institutional architecting. Um, I think I've never really thought about superpower. It's actually a term that kind of uh, has, has bothered me a little bit over the years. Um, but if I said, if I, if I had any, it really is basically just finding the entanglements and things and understanding where there's value and stories and meaning. Everything from um, things to people to ideas and, and on up from there. Uh, complex entanglements. Awesome. Thanks, Anne. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mike. And oh, and I'm here because of Jerry, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that should just be the tagline to all of us. Um, so Mike and Olga, you guys are on deck, and then Angel, we'll hear from you after them. Hi, everyone uh, from, from Madrid, Spain. Can, can you hear yep. me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm the founder of uh, Ideagoras, uh, which is a company founded back in 2009 uh, to explore those principles under uh, the market of conversation, the first thesis of the Crude Trend Manifesto. Uh, I met uh, Jerry uh, in ExoWorld as well, and I got really, really inspired and hooked by his uh, mindset about uh, trust, the principle of trust. And since I'm now in an intersection of evolving my company, because social media marketing has uh, left all the uh, good things that attract to me. Uh, and now I'm heading through human branding to put branding, uh, to put human in the middle of everything. And I do really think that uh, everything is, is, is being run by mistrust. Uh, it got my attention. I asked uh, to Jerry for a contact in LinkedIn. We met and uh, we had uh, last week a, a nice conversation in Spanish. His Spanish is great. And uh, he invited me to, to, to attend this, this, this meeting. Uh, and I'm very excited to learn about uh, Open Global Mind with all you. Great. My superpower is uh, being an enthusiast. Uh, I'm a kind of professional dreamer. I'm always being a professional dreamer. Awesome. I love it. Welcome. I'll give you a yes. Thank you, Anel. All right. So Mike and Olga, we'll go with you guys now. And then uh, David, you'll be on deck. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Peeler. Uh, I am a software developer in Cincinnati and um, came here uh, via Matt. I've known Matt. Um, pretty much my whole life, and that's not an exaggeration. So I'm um, very happy to be here. Uh, I think my superpower is um, uh, grunt. Um, I, given a task or a problem, I'll, I can't let it go. So I, <laughs> I power through. So uh, like I said earlier, it can be a uh, super weakness as well, uh, but I'll take it as a superpower for now. And I'm Olga Peeler. I am, I am the second Peeler of the duo. Uh, I have known Matt for half my life. <laughs> I was the foreign exchange student from Spain, Angel, <laughs> at their high school and um, Cincinnati, Ohio as well. And my superpower is actually ignition and connection, which I think then that makes us uh, <laughs> a pretty good combo since I can get things started and then Mike can 
make sure that they get finished. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, guys. Thank you so much. We're so glad to have you here. All right, David, you are up, and then April, you're on deck. Hello, everybody. I'm David Howard. I'm here from Kalamazoo. I'm actually uh, a close friend of Matt's ideas, so it was wonderful to get an invitation and, and getting to know all of you. Um, I, I'm, I've come up through uh, you know, uh, the CPG game. I'm a young entrepreneur. I've started many brands as far as distribution and um, been able to take a couple public. And um, as far as the superpower goes, I've um, most, most likely is, is understanding a room, understanding people, being able to motivate my own personal sales team and get the most out of people. It's a great superpower, David. Thank you, man. Yeah. All right. So we have left just so you guys know we're here. So April, you're up. And then we've got Philip, Ken, and Shay, who we've not heard from. So April, why don't you go? And then Philip, you'll be on deck. Sure. Uh, good morning. Good evening, everyone. Delighted to be here. Uh, I know many faces. Those of you who I don't will quickly discover that um, I'm here because of Jerry, because I'm married to Jerry as well. So <laughs> I think I would want to be here in my own right, but I, I do get to have, I suppose, the, the lucky honor of saying, other than Jerry, I think I've seen more of his brain than anybody on the planet. <laughs> um, and uh, where am I right now? In Portland, Oregon, about 10 feet from Jerry. I actually can see him over there. So um, really happy to be here. I think my superpower, this is quite funny listening to everyone else's because I think there were a couple that I could echo as well. Um, I'll take it a different direction and I'll give two, one which I think Jerry would say is my superpower. Um, and I never thought of it this way until uh, we met and we met 13 years ago last Friday. So we just celebrated the anniversary of our, we sort of think our first, the first time we met was almost as important, if not more important than our actual wedding anniversary. <laughs> um, and Jerry would say that I have laser focus that if I decide a mountain needs to be moved, I will look at that mountain and I will just, you know, figure out some way to move it. Um, so that's, I think, what he would say my superpower is. And then just for fun, um, I still can stand on my hands and walk on my hands. And there was the point a few years ago where I realized that people my age are no longer standing and walking on their hands. And it's a superpower, I think, because I like to frame it in the, in the context of upside down perspective. So when you go upside down, you literally see the world upside down and you see the same things differently. You say the same problems in a different way. You see, you know, it's sort of just, it, it, it really is quite helpful for how you see the world um, and how you see how things connect together. So that would be, um, I suppose, the superpower or at least my party trick, right? So glad to that. be here. Thank you, April. That's great. I want you and Mike on my zombie apocalypse team for the uh, laser focus <laughs> and the grunt. Um, all right. So I want all of you, by the way, that wasn't, sorry about this, particularly for finding food, maybe. Um, so, uh, Philip, let's hear from you and then Ken, you're on deck and then Shay, we'll hear from you. Hey guys, coming from Maine here. My, my zoom backdrop is, is real. This is authentic <laughs> in woods here, uh, here because I know Matt's and Hamilton. I think we met when Matt spilled beer on me at Fenway park, but it's all a little, it's all a little hazy there. <laughs> Uh, I'm professor of philosophy and religion at the University of Maine. I also run a little institute up here called Seguinland Institute, where we do programs in alternative ed, you might say. You can check that out. And then my third little venture is called Seguin Tree Dwellings, where my wife and I have designed and built these, these little tree houses in the woods of Maine and created sort of a a little mini retreat center here where, speaking of standing on your head to change perspective, we, we love the idea of the literal change of perspective that happens when people inhabit these tree dwellings that we've, that we've built. So, um, so that might give you a little sense of my superpowers here, but I would, similar, similar to a lot of you, I would say, um, yeah, I get a thrill out of connecting things that don't usually get connected, whether those are people or ideas or people in places. Uh, I love connecting old ideas to new situations, new scenarios. Um, <clears throat> what else? I think a lot about how individuals and groups uh, navigate experiences of extreme transition, I would say, and particularly the role of ritual. 
and aesthetic experience in navigating these kinds of these kinds of transitions. So looking forward to the conversation here. Thanks. Awesome, Philip. So two other things. One, I think I echo April and everyone when we asked you to send the link to the tree dwellings so that we can all see them because they are amazing. I have seen them. Uh, and you also forgot to mention that you used to run a, a grilled cheese food cart called Lefties. Oh, that's right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's, Philip is a, is a maker. He's a doer. He just makes things happen. <laughs> Philip, we're really glad to day. have you here, man. Thank you. Grilled cheese by day, Nietzsche by night. That was our slogan. Yeah. <laughs> Words slip by. Um, all right. Uh, Really ha happy to have you here, Philip. Ken, you're up, and then Shay will hear from you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ken Homer. I'm calling in from San Rafael, California. Um, I have known Jerry for, I think, 12 or 13 years. We met around 07, 08 um, at a birthday party for our mutual friend, Elizabeth Doty. Jerry was the first person to ever show me an iPhone. I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. So um, I have a lot of, uh, over the years, lots of warm memories of being with Jerry in various uh, contexts. Um, my superpower, uh, I'm going to say two. One is helping groups be smarter together than they are as individuals. And the other is weirding. I have been a student of Michael Mead for a long time, and I can't verify this through etymology online, but Michael says the word weird is originally Welsh, and it means to have, uh, to follow your weird is to have one foot in this world and one foot in the other world. And so by balancing, going back and forth between this world and the other world is how we heal the world. So I'm weird like that. Quick question, is there that. one other world? Oh, there are many right. other worlds. <laughs> this is Celtic mythologies, but uh, yeah, there are, I, I probably have feet I probably have more than two feet, probably have many, many different feet in many worlds and a few hands too. And, and um, heads, I'm not sure about. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Ken. Uh, all right. So uh, for our guest, Shay, you're the last, you're the last guest to introduce himself and then you'll Hank and Jerry and Matt and I'll do a little introduction. Sure. Um, so hi everyone. I'm Shay Fahrenbach. I'm here through Jerry, of course. Um, <clears throat> I'm a co-founder of OpenEXO. Um, I started working with Salim back in 2015, uh, starting many EXO related businesses and um, worked on strategy there, but kind of found my niche in the community. So I was sort of running the OpenEXO community, building it out. Um, and I think, um, I wouldn't, I agree with a few of the comments. I'm not sure that I have any real superpowers, but things that I'm good at. And I think one of them is uh, uh, making people feel, people feel welcome in a community, uh, making them feel sort of comfortable and at home um, and connected. Uh, and I think that's clearly a common theme here. Um, I was working with the EXO, which is all of this uh, innovation, disruption, exponential technologies world. And I left that um, after starting to question, you know, what does our world and our society really need? Um, and so I'm calling you right now from Salt Spring Island, which is a small island um, off the coast of Vancouver. Uh, from a farm. So I'm currently farming and getting really into the regenerative agriculture movement um, and uh, really loving that. So uh, Philip, you have trees. I can see goats out of our window right now. So, <laughs> you know, there's quite a, an interesting dynamic for me having kind of done in a way a 180. And so I'm really glad to be in this conversation because I think that I've got a lot of interesting perspective and maybe can bring some from balance to how we think about our technological connected world. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Shay. Thanks for joining. I'm jealous of all of you. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a couple of collected next people. So why don't we do the CN folks and then Jerry, you could do the last introduction and we'll get into it. So um, Chris, Henry, I know you're on the phone and you joined late. You want to do a, a say a quick hello, an introduction? Yeah, hi guys. Um, um, my name is Chris Henry. I work closely with Matt and Hank and also sometimes Hamilton. Um, I'm going to be taking some visual notes for you guys in the background that we'll be able to, to show you a little later. Um, I feel like my superpower is flexible since I was officially asked to do this maybe a little over a half hour ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> One of many superpowers, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Hank. Hey, Hank, also at Collective Next, worked pretty closely with you know, yeah, Chris, Matt, and 
you know, Ham and have been talking to Jerry about this too for, for a couple months. Um, as far as my superpower, geez, I think I got a, a couple. I think one is just, uh, you know, I, I can be pretty relentless. Um, so I don't really stop at, at things either. Um, I think the other thing is just, uh, I think I have a, a lot of courage. The only thing is that I think in the, on the weakness category, it can border line, it can, uh, border on being a little reckless, um, with, with some things. Um, but I think lastly, really, uh, my, my real superpower is being able to kind of like stop and sit back and scan, um, when, especially just kind of sitting on the outside and like help other people do that as well to kind of just, just take intentional pauses. Um, I'm, I'm good at kind of feeling when and where and how to do that. So. Awesome. Thanks, Hank. Uh, Matt, quick introduction. We're going to hear more from you. I know, but yeah, real quick, uh, Matt Saia, um, uh, I, I guess I know myself and Jerry, and, um, um, and I think my superpower for people who know me is words, 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 words. Uh, I can talk to anyone about big things and um, love to do it and love to just expand my own view of the world and other people and uh, help other people do the same. So awesome. Thanks, Matt. Nice to meet you. Great to have you here. Uh, Jerry, why don't you go and then I'll, I'll wrap this part up and then we'll bridge to the, uh, to getting into it. That sounds great. Um, I'm just so happy to see everybody here. It's really thrilling. Uh, I'm Jerry Mikulski. I'm in Portland, Oregon, about a dozen feet from April. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> my connection to being here is, I think, is something we're going to get into in, in a second here, but I've had a long standing frustration with how we meet, how we make decisions, <clears throat> our lack <clears throat> excuse me, our lack of common memory, all those kinds of things. And um, they're kind of playing out in a good way at this, at this really spectacularly weird and dangerous moment. So I just want to take a, a second while introducing myself to honor the people who are in the streets uh, protesting and trying to figure out how to move society to a better place, honor the people who have been hurt um, in this whole process, um, honor the people who are not being heard um, part of a big piece of open global mind is open mindedness <clears throat> and trying to make space for understanding people who normally don't have a seat at the table. Um, so that's a, a big piece of why we've invited you all here. So you'll hear more about this in just a second as we try to unpack what this idea is. Great. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, and I, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hamilton. I am calling in from Boston. Um, I mean, I, without sounding completely egocentric, I'm the reason that all of you guys are here, but hey, actually, you know what Peter is, Peter Van is, um, and there's a lot more to that. So I'm gonna get into that story uh, in a bit more because there's some good context to set it up. Um, I will say um, that my superpower, I guess, is, is humor um, in that I really um, can use it to just sort of disarm some charged things. I'm a facilitator by trade, and so um, I use humor a lot. Uh, Peter K, as you said, I think my super weakness is that I often think that I'm funnier than anybody else thinks that I am. So, um, you know, that's how it comes back to bite me. But that's the strength that I try to use. Um, and maybe we'll bring a little bit of that today. So uh, here we go, guys. Quick house rules. Uh, we say this at the top of every call. Uh, you cannot apologize for anything that happens around you. If your dog jumps in your lap, if your daughter starts playing piano, that just adds to the texture and character of this call. So no apologizing. Uh, use chat. Uh, you, I don't have to say it because you guys are already doing that. I would use that instead of raising your hand because I will be honest, I have not mastered being a facilitator with the Zoom hand raising thing, um, but give it a go. Maybe it'll work, uh, but certainly use chat. And then the last thing I would say is since there's so many of us, if you could mute when you're not talking, it might just help with some of the disruption, um, but you guys are all Zoom pros. All right. So let me start off with why we're here. Um, I'm going to switch back to gallery view, which is a nice way I can see all your wonderful faces. Uh, this, the reason we're here, it starts with, uh, it's, it's Boston. Um, it is 2014. God, I should have written this down. Peter, whenever Cybos was in Boston, which I feel like was 2014, maybe 2015, um, Peter was running a thing called InnoTribe at uh, Cybos. So he worked for Swift, Cybos, big banking, 8,000 people conference, networking, $17,000 million to pull it off. And then part of that though, was an InnoTribe stage. And, and it was, InnoTribe was something that was year long, but it came to one of its big moments was this Cybos conference where 
Peter, as a curator, was in charge of bringing new thinking, stretching these very conservative bankers and, and sort of institutions into what's next? Where's fintech going? How is thinking going to evolve in a way that's going to impact you? Um, and so he was trying to sort of, and he was also trying to break the paradigm of content engagement at a very sort of pedestrian term. Like you go to a conference, you see a speaker, maybe there's a Q&A, you leave, and it's, that's not why you go there. And he really wanted to break that paradigm. He really wanted to get to something that was more participant led, uh, that was a more open ended and not reductive, that didn't leave people with one idea, but with 10 ideas. And, and, um, and he also wanted to make it very entertaining. Uh, he wanted to make it more than just a talk, but how do you engage people's full self, right? So they bring their emotional and their physical and their intellectual self to a talk or to some content so they can, it can resonate on all three of those levels. Um, he was changing the game. Peter is a fascinating man. Um, and he started to use terms like sense-making and instigators. Like he had at this financial services conference, he brought in musicians and artists. Um, and so we had a great relationship. We did three Inno tribes with Peter where he would bring us in and we would help him create facilitation. We would, you know, people like Chris would graphic facilitate. We'd bring a lot of creativity to it. Uh, we were, I said this to him the other day, he was probably the perfect, the best client I've ever had. Um, he was just so perfectly got us. Anyway, he left Swift. We kept talking um, and we, we fell into a monthly talk, which is, I, is one of the highlights of my month, every month. Uh, and one day, Peter and I were talking and um, on how like you, we were talking about trust because it was big for me because I was just seeing a real lack of it. And it felt like that was the, um, the one barrier to getting into any conversations. You know, in, uh, the, the Zen meditation rooms, they have that bar, the Zendo that you have to step over to, to recognize that you're going into this meditation room. Trust was the Zendo, like no one could get past that thing. So Peter's like, that's interesting. And we've talked a little bit. And then we talked about scribing and storytelling and how do you, how do you carry information forward? And, and Peter said, a friend of mine has this idea of story threading. I was like, huh, that's interesting, story threading. He's like, this guy, yeah, you should talk to him. His name's Jerry. Um, he has a lot more to say than just trust and story threading, as you guys who all know. So he set up a call and I, I met Jerry. Um, and that was a great moment. So that was probably, that was right at the, like March 16th. I think that was the week when everything started to shut down. Interesting times, Jerry, maybe, maybe the week before. Um, maybe my timing's off, but anyway, I want to stop at this point, and Jerry, I want you to go back a little bit in more in depth and sort of bring us back to, you know, you being a tech analyst, not the full, you know, not the full April story, I'm sure she could tell it, but the, you know, like, <laughs> sort of the highlights and the brain that brought you to where, when you and I talked, a spark was lit, because then Mark, then Matt came in. So maybe you could catch us up a little bit. That sounds great. Okay. And I'll, 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 I'll try to be brief. So I was a tech industry trends analyst for a dozen years, uh, not a Wall Street analyst. I can't, I don't care what next uh, quarter's numbers are, but a trends analyst. And I was advising a lot of large corporations for part of that journey, for part of that dozen years. Um, and then two weird things happened in that dozen years. One is a little, a little one of the 4,000 odd software vendors that pitched me their services so that I might write about them so that they would get a little bit of spotlight um, had a mind mapping tool called The Brain. And they're at thebrain.com. I'll put some links in the, in the chat. And um, well, I remember booking the appointment thinking, rolling my eyes a little bit, thinking, yeah, right, the brain, whatever. And then the moment the inventor opens his laptop sitting next to me, his name is Harlan, um, and starts demoing it, I'm like, oh, wait, my brain works kind of like this. So I wrote about them, I invited them to our conference, <clears throat> gave them a little spotlight, and then started using the tool, not realizing that 22 years later, the links I've just sent you in the chat to my brain are to the same data file that I started 22 plus years ago. So in December, it'll be 23 years. So I spent more than two decades curating one mind map where I put anything that's worth remembering. Now, I don't put crap in there because I realize that it's kind of got a namespace because I have to name every node in my brain is called a thought. Um, I have to name them. And if I misspell them, I won't find them again because it's not as clever as Google is about, you know, sound decks and finding misspelled things. <clears throat> so I have to curate this thing. And Bill asks in the thread how many nodes. I'm at 425,000, over 425,000 nodes put in by me by hand over these 22 years, connected by more than three quarters of a million links, because I can, I can link these nodes. And I'll, I'll do a little screen share later uh, as appropriate, um, just to, to give you an idea of what it is. Anyway, I'm the Brain's lead user, obviously, but also their most frustrated user, because 
I would love to be in an open environment where I could collaborate with other people doing the same thing. Instead, what I end up doing is showing people what I've like, hey, look, this is what I learned long ago and here's how I represent it. And here are links to the original articles and so on and so forth. And that's a neat conversation. So I have a, a blog I call uh, Inside Jerry's Brain. And you, if you go to insidejerrysbrain.com, you can kind of sign up to, to see those, to, to be in those. But really I was trying to figure out how might we improve conversation by having, by having a lot of people curate context and having more people refer to it the way we take Wikipedia for granted today. And Wikipedia is a lovely project. It's a great open content, open source thing. I point to Wikipedia all the time as an example. And yet, it's not allowed to express a point of view. It has, in fact, a policy they developed because it's an encyclopedia called neutral point of view on purpose. So how might we do that? And then a whole bunch of other things kind of happen in between. But um, I also have produced a lot of events and have been in a lot of events and was really frustrated that, that when I saw graphic facilitators, some of whom would do beautiful inspired work channeling what was being said in the room and writing it on huge sheets of paper on the wall, that when they wrote something on the wall like racism in America, it was ink on, on paper or pastel on paper that was going to turn into a snapshot and either be lost in a, in a PDF or something like that. And when I connect something to racism in America, I'm connecting it to everything I've figured out about it, all the best articles and analyses and explanations and everything else. I have a rich, rich context on these issues. So um, I was frustrated because I think that we're stupider as a society because we don't have a shared memory. That I, I call this, we're an amnesic society. Um, we're drowning in the flood because every six months it seems somebody invents a new tool, let's say Slack or uh, Snapchat or whatever, or Instagram. And so every, a lot of people adopt the new tool and then you have a new place to monitor, more stuff to do. And if you miss something as it went by, it's lost in the flow and it doesn't become a part of your context. So I ask people, how do you remember good URLs, right? And most people like shrug and most people giggle. And I say, do you use the, the, the bookmark feature in your browser? And there's usually tortured laughter. Um, and so I've had the good luck to have a tool that let me remember what I've seen that's worthwhile and curate it into a context. And I would love to see that um, grow into how more of us converse, decide, debate, um, inform, etc. cetera. I, and, and, and the brain is one of many different kinds of visualizations. And so part of the idea for Open Global Mind was, can we create a place where we can be open-minded, but also where we can help bring together a lot of these tools, on top of some, some uh, open distributed data that's trustworthy? And can we also layer on top of that some forms of discourse that let us mend some of what's broken right now? Because we're suffering from, a, from sort of a denial of discourse attack worldwide, that it's, it's actually very hard to have conversations all over the place. And these are important conversations we need to have. So that's a, a big piece of the inspiration for Open Global Mind. Is, is these different streams. One of them was, hey, I'm using this weirdo mind mapping tool and look, 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 look what it's enabled me to do. It's changed my life. I wish more of us could talk in that way. Another one is, gosh, when we're busy talking, we don't remember stuff, we can't refer back to it. And it's, there's not this context for us to work with uh, and, then, and, and then more. So let me pause yeah. there. No, oh, that's great, and um, and you're 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 teeing up sort of the the, the media conversation, which is fantastic. I would like to sort of go back, play a little bit of go back in history because while Jerry was doing that, Matt was sort of you know on unwittingly or unknowingly on his path towards this conversation as well. Um, and and you know, Matt, I've known you not as long as Mike and Olga, but for quite some time, and worked with you for twenty years. Um, but maybe. And so there's a lot of things that I know this connects with you, right? You, you founded Collective Next and a lot of these principles and the same desire. But, but maybe take, take us back to, you're an art school and you, you, you chose a type of art because you wanted to accomplish something, this sort of sculpture and engaging communities. And so, and maybe I'm putting you on the spot there, but there's something there that I think began this, began it for you, at least your story in my mind, right? So catch us up to, what brought you when you were, I introduced you to Jerry, where you're like, oh my God, ah! the, just so you, you know, Matt and Jerry spoke, for, it was supposed to be an hour long conversation. It went for three hours and Matt's wife had to hang up the phone on them. So um, <laughs> as you can imagine, anyway, I, I'm talking too much. Matt, tell us your story. Yeah, I, I, Hamilton, you, nobody can talk as much maybe as I can. And um, so I, I'll, <laughs> I'll try to be brief, but I was introduced to a concept when I was really young by um, 
the CEO of the company my dad worked for. His name was Mr. Flagg, and he was a pretty big influence. And he would invite me over and think out loud with me, right? That's what he called it. And we'd sit in his office and he'd bring up a topic, topics probably too big for kids like, you know, religion and politics and all the places that we were always taught to avoid. And, um, and I was always curious about understanding the world, making sense of the world around me. Um, and um, also have sort of this creative spirit ab about, about it. And um, like most kids didn't think art was going to be a career, went into school to, um, uh, be a scientist, came out as an art major, and my work transformed from things that I made into trying to set up processes that illuminate the world around you. And I ended up going to the San Francisco Art Institute and dropping out because the art world itself is a little too insular, uh, or at least of this conversation. I wanted the bigger conversation, but the work was all about how do you set up processes that allow for um, the world and communities to start to expose themselves to each other so that they can collectively make sense out of what's what's going on. Um, I had a little LED light board in a small studio apartment on the streets of San Francisco in the Tenderloin, just kind of a little bit of a dodgy neighborhood if anyone um, there where people could put little slips of paper into the box and then I would type them in every night. It was almost like think about it as an early version of Twitter. Um, but the things that came out were everything that you've seen in, in the world, right? Where people were wishing, putting their wishes there, but people were also saying, here's the best place to go and, and, and get free food and the best place to, to, to find drugs and, and other things of that nature. Um, but that led me on this idea of um, really being an active participation, participant in the change making process. And Collective Next is all about, um, you know, for us helping our clients, but I really see it as much bigger helping the world create what's next. Um, and so when Hamilton introduced me to Jerry, I'm the opposite of Jerry. I haven't, um, I'm not the kind of the log everything in my brain in that regard. Um, I'm, I'm living on the sort of the dream space side of things, always taking that stuff and creating those, that future. And I think that combination, that alchemy that happened was um, quite remarkable. Um, and we've been talking twice a week now uh, for uh, a couple of hours and the ability to sustain a conversation is something that I think we've lost in, in this world. Um, we have these sort of fragmented moments. And so that's the part that's really attracting me is how do we collectively um, sense what's going on um, and then make sense of that and then use that as a platform to actually catalyze real change. Because I think that the problems that we're facing in this world are so complex and they're so intertwined. They're, and you know, we say you know, what's going on with um, institutionalized racism in this country and actually globally is systemic. Well, they're systemic in the same way that everything is systemic. And how do you get your hands and heads around that and that's kind of my inspiration for uh, you know being here, and and I'm so happy to see so many different uh, people on this call because I think uh, we have a real shot at this. Um, so I'll let me pause there. That's great, man. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm just loving how everyone's using the chat and just how um, Lina, I think it was you, uh, how just sort of awe inspiring this group is, and just all the the sort of thoughtfulness and intelligence that's there. So so excited and really want to hear from you guys. So um, so let me let me just sort of set up the conversation and you guys, so 45 minutes in, I think that was a great 45 minutes, but now we really want to talk about it. And, you know, I don't want this to be a linear conversation because it's, it's every time we get on the phone, like Matt says, it goes in all these different tangents and it's super exciting. And I would love to have that same dynamic with all your genius here. But, you know, when we talk about it, the, th the, the, the conversation really revolves around, nothing surprising, the why, right? And, and we sense it all, you, you know, the, I'm sitting there reading about how the editor of the New York Times um, resigned and all that led to that. And I also think about like some beleaguered Facebook moderator of my neighborhood group, and they're both facing the same things, right? Of like, how do I make sense? And what is right? And what is wrong? And it's overwhelming. There's no way to do it. So, you know, I feel like the why is really big, this need to be able to connect and think and this, all the stuff that Jerry said. 
But then you say, okay, why? But then we, we get into what? What are we talking about here? Jerry talked about layers and that, the, you know, there's a think space on top of it. And there's a, obviously a platform space. So what are we talking about when we say this open global mind concept? Um, you know, and I'll be honest with you. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read the books or seen the show, The Expanse, which is a futuristic show where life happens on Mars has been colonized and even further out. And one of the things that, that makes the whole Expanse universe possible is this thing called an Epstein drive, which is they spend like two paragraphs on it that says there is this guy Epstein who invented this thing that lets you travel at the speed of light and you didn't get sick and die. And you're like, oh, okay. And so that was it. And not how, not the physics, not ever, but basically it made interstellar travel possible without ever explaining how. So a little bit of what we have with this OGM still is this Epstein drive. We have, we have this why, we know what we want it to do, but what it looks like is still very much undefined. And that's why we brought you guys in this conversation. So there, there is a what this thing is. Uh, there is a how it can be used. You know, Jerry, I don't know if you had the chance to see the video, we have the subprime crisis of how something like this could be used to maybe avoid those types of things. And so how, what do you do with something? We understand why you do it, but how do you use it? And then the big one is who? And this again brings us back to you. Who, who needs to be part of something like this? Something that is this collaborative, that is this collective, that's bigger than any one person or institution or organization. Who needs to run it? Who needs to build it? Who needs to govern it? So we have a lot of ideas on that we wanna share with you, but this is where we start to value your input. Okay, so we wanna talk about sort of what and why and how and who, and then where do we go from here? Uh, because we want all of you involved in some, whether you're just lurking, whether you're just reading the digest, maybe sending some notes, or you're rolling up your sleeves and joining us on every call, we'd love to have you involved and we really wanna understand how do we best keep you guys involved moving forward um, with this Epstein drive to destinations unknown. So that's the conversation. I'm going to stop talking here and, I'm going to, and I want to start back to, you know, Jerry, you talked about why and who this would be for. Um, I want both of you guys to, to go a little bit deeper into that because then you, I think with why we would need it, we'd also get into how could, how, how could you envision people actually using this Epstein drive, right? Where could value come from something like this? Uh, and again, I encourage everyone to use the chat and uh, let's have a conversation. Jerry, I'll, I'll you kick it off, Matt. Why don't you go after that? Um, yeah, it's um, it, it's funny. Uh, one of the conversations that's important right now is how to understand uh, what's happening with Black Lives Matter, white privilege. Uh, how how do we how how can we be good allies to what's happening on on the streets right now? And one of the ways to do that is to talk about systemic racism and the history that most people ignore and are unwilling to talk about. Um, and how I'm, I'm extremely intrigued in how to have that conversation in a way that people who are on the opposite side of the belief system around those things for me would listen and participate. Because if we're just talking to ourselves, if, if we're talking to people who are convinced that systemic racism is, exists and has been extremely hard to exterminate, uh, or shift, um, that's one thing. If we can manage to sort of dissolve uh, some of those barriers and talk to other people. So here I'm, I'm actually, uh, OGM is partly inspired by Daryl Davis, uh, who is a jazz musician, a pianist, who has a collection of some two or 300 KKK robes in his garage because he started attending KKK meetings. He started being very patient and entering conversation with people who very obviously were on the other side philosophically from him. And his question to them was always, how can you hate me if you don't even know me? And he, he really patiently sat and talked with them over time and that melted a lot of their resistance, which is fabulous. That, that's kind of at the, at the level of, of, of discourse and reaching out to the other. And I have a belief that if we could organize our beliefs better and present them to one another, we might be able to have that conversation in some kind of a semi-organized way. And, and I have a, a different belief, which is that emotion and membership usually trump logic anyway. And that even if I build a really great visual explanation that was very logical and well-structured, that would have trouble in the face of different sorts of belief systems, right? Wait, hold, Jerry, uh, I want to stop you. Yeah, yeah. Lauren, give, give voice Jump to in, this. Lauren. Yeah, yeah. Give voice to and, this. And you're welcome to do the... Yeah. 
I don't know. I mean, it seems like, uh, you know, I went into this misinformation conference and the whole point of the conference is like, how do we figure out what is the misinformation and tag it and uh, make sure that people know that this is misinformation and no one cares. It's like the best story wins. So it's really like the art of storytelling. It's not about like, you know, is this good information or bad information people don't care they go for the story that confirms their beliefs that's in their heads so um i think you're on the right track jerry for sure when all the research i've done so i'm really interested in what other people think about this boundary between storytelling and and logic like like how is that working is it is it that humans just are always going to be triggered by the story and we're, the story is going to carry the day and we should forget about logic or is it that we're not accustomed to doing, to logicking together. Charles. Charles, yeah. I had a tiny story just to, to put in the mix here, which is just going back to this um, question or issue or label about race as a, as a kind of container for a story or a set of stories or conversation. Um, I was part of, uh, I'm not gonna name names here. I was part of a, of a group call actually celebrating a birthday of um, African-American founder of a startup um, in the Bay Area. Um, and it was just kind of his, inner circle people, um, including um, a VC and an investor in the company and an advisor, also happened to be African-American who had a quick story. Um, and maybe it wasn't one story, it was maybe a, a pattern of repeatedly getting pulled over um, by police in his car. And for example, driving en route to the boardroom to have a meeting and the need to be jovial right away after this uh, victimization. Um, and then the phrase that jumped out <clears throat> Is, is your skin color is your currency. So thank you, over. Hey, and um, I, I'm gonna sort of just do something a little abrupt here. Philip, I know that we're gonna lose you at the top of the hour because you you this is a, you don't have the time, but we're gonna lose you soon. And yeah. you know, it's interesting we talk about news and stuff, but then there's theology and religion that you talk about where some, some of those absolutes are not there, right? And where do you find the struggles and people being able to have productive conversations around some of the more spiritual stuff, or do you? Yeah, I mean, I could delve into that directly, but even a little more broadly. Um, so my, my first book project was about people who grow up in fundamentalist religious communities and find their way out. And I wanted to focus in particular on those who found their way out through some kind of aesthetic experience where they didn't just reason their way out they didn't just have really well organized information presented to them, but they had this a variety of, of kinds of aesthetic experiences. And then to figure out how that goes down, what, what are the factors, what, are, what, what types of contexts in which you might have an aesthetic experience can lead to this transformation of belief. Um, so, I, you know, I could throw out there a few of, a few of my conclusions um, were that if, if an aesthetic experience humanizes someone that you previously labeled as untrustworthy or as an outsider, then that had real potential to leverage you out of that incredibly fixed mindset that is fundamentalism. Um, or if the aesthetic object could, uh, or the aesthetic experience could create some sense of a shared object of desire with someone who was previously labeled as an outsider or a heretic or um, someone not to be, to be trusted, then it could have this, this incredible effect at transforming even the most entrenched kinds of beliefs and identities. And I, that, I think that was another conclusion that, you know, the, what we tend to think of as someone changing a belief was actually much more about changing an identity. So I don't know. I mean, this. <laughs> wow. Well, well, <laughs> either either everyone just you sent a shock through the computer that made everybody's hands come off their keyboards, <laughs> or they that really resonated with people. That's yeah. awesome. So yeah. I mean, and, okay. and I, Judy, I know your hand's up, so I want to see you, but let's, so you're next, Judy, but let Matt go ahead. Philip, finish what you're going to say. Matt, you say what you're going to say. I would just say that I, I think it could be something if you had some kind of site, some aggregator site, whatever the, the larger vision here is, 
that took very seriously from, from the outset and built right into the architecture and appreciation for the power of aesthetic experience of encounters with beauty and awe and wonder and that, you know, kind of like you were saying, Hamilton, that in order to cross the threshold into this space, you had to first go through an experience like this, an aesthetic experience, an encounter yeah. with the beautiful, the unconceptualizable. Um, that would be something, that would be quite a contribution and I think would really boost the efficacy of of everything that you would encounter once you entered that space. And just quickly, I mean, you know, if you think about some of the, whatever, some of the aggregator sites out there and uh, they're so utilitarian, there's no sense of, of valuing beauty or aesthetic experience, whether that's Reddit or Wikipedia, et cetera, right? And it's just yeah. pure utilitarian. Could you do something different by baking that in from the beginning? Yeah, thanks. Matt, what were you gonna say? I, I I was just going to revisit like that that first question of the of the why right and you know Philip thank you for you know sharing I completely uh, uh, subscribe to it and we, as we've been talking about um, this platform we've been talking about that it, we don't only need think space but we need dream space we need that that creative space that aesthetic space maybe is the right way to talk about it um, but at the end of the day we're already in the, we're already doing what open global mind is about. We're starting to share our perspectives. We're starting to bring things together. But if you go all the way back, human beings, because of our uniqueness of our species, have been wrestling with issues, the same issue since the very beginning. And that's the relationship that we have with each other and the relationship that we have with the world around us and the universe that we exist in. And at the scale that we have gotten, we've gotten actually worse at those conversations. Right. I mean, you look at all of these indigenous practices and rituals and and things that used to bring us into this world in a more harmonious way that have been lost um, over over time. I think, you know, the ultimate why for me is I believe that if we as a species don't solve for ourselves as human beings together at the scale where we can actually all become um, you know, change our identities together that we're, we won't be here for very much longer, right? In the grand scheme of things. And so um, I think that's the, that's the burning why is whatever the topic of the day is, whatever the rage is about, um, we're not solving it. We're sort of just moving on to the next, you know, the next thing. And I think that's where um, I hope that this goes is a, is a platform not in the technical sense, but in the true sense for human beings to wrestle with the kind of the deepest, darkest secrets that that we have and and start yeah. to solve them together. So yeah. um, that's my why. So that's great. Um, thanks, Matt and um, Jerry. Just a note: let's make sure we publish the chat because there's like I think we we're oh yeah writing like one of the best books ever written over here in the chat. We'll, but um, we'll post Judy, the video to YouTube and we'll post the chat and send it to everybody who's been on, on the call as well. That's awesome, um, Judy, patient Judy. <laughs> oh, you're on mute though. Oh, Judy, you're on mute. Judy, you're still muted. Yeah. There I'm you go. Sorry. Patience has never been described as one of my virtues. Um, <laughs> in fact, I was counseled once that I could at least manage my impatience, <laughs> uh, which I found actually the most helpful thing anyone had ever said. Um, but I'm struggling a little bit with the scope of how we're going to start this. And I'm wondering if a concept that I like called dendritic, which is sort of the continuous expansion out through multiple tendrils um, is we're kind of talking about nucleation and multiple nucleation sites. And if that sounds scientific, it's because part of my background, but the idea is how do you start an idea and how does the idea self propagate? And then it comes back to this issue of community and belonging and self esteem and self worth, which is very difficult to address given the diversity of experiences of all of the people. So it seems to me that the brain is a wonderful approach cognitively, but I don't know how we humanize it 
because essentially people only hear from people they feel connected to. It's sort yeah. of like spitting in the wind. If they don't feel a connection, which is why they say storytelling is important, share your personal story. Maybe there's a connection that will open a small window through which you can be heard. There's a, a dimension of that that's part of humanity's strength. But if it hasn't worked for people, it becomes a barrier that's hard to surmount. And so I don't have an answer. I liked April's comment about reaching children because children are less walled off. Yeah. And if we can get to families through their children, that's a starting point. But it almost feels like we need a massive social movement of people reaching other people and trying to genuinely start by trying to understand the other instead of representing yourself. Um, I don't know. I, I'm wandering. That's great. No. And Jerry, Sam, Sam Payne shot up. Yeah, yeah, and then we'll go back to you. Go ahead, yep. Sam. I wanted to uh, riff on what Judith just said, because I do um, also want to riff on, and I apologize because of my poor brain, whoever spoke most about trust, about you know that being so crucial. On how? Because uh, each of you has probably been, as I have been, in multiple kinds of forums and conversations like this with different degrees of success, I suspect. But one of the things that actually comes up and this is a call one of my smart people problems, is that it does take time. It does take time because even though trust can be transitive as we all kind of trust Jerry and therefore that's why we're here, it's still helpful to build it in a pairwise, you know, one-to-one -one basis. And so I would, if anything, uh, when I hear the word impatience, my, my trigger here is um, that impatience could impede the normal evolution of some of that trust. It takes a lot of one-on-ones, breakouts, you know, discussions, disagreements, etc., to really understand that and overcome some of that impatience. So even in the GCC conversation where I've been for probably three years now, we're just beginning to understand what agreements mean. And that sounds trivial, but it's really, really deep when we actually explore that idea for three years. And then uh, I just want to also say one more thing, and that is, the idea of story to me is a layer of navigation and presentation above another layer I call knowledge, or you can call it the distributed knowledge repository. This is an Engelbartian extended idea, but that knowledge of how you tell a story or how you present something to a six-year-old and you would do it differently to a 16-year-old and you would do it differently to Jerry and you would do it differently to a PhD student, even though the fundamental knowledge base could be the same. It could be gravity, it could be emotions, it could be Jungian psychology, whatever it could be. But you do it differently to each person. And so if we actually take the time to understand who it is we're trying to reach, and what results we're trying to accomplish, and how we want to establish the heart connection first before we get into the head. I mean, who, somebody wiser than me said something like, I don't care what you know until I know how much you care. Hmm. And until we do that, it's like, you know, we're just talking at this level and not really connecting down here. So that was all triggered when I heard the word impatience. Sorry to go on so long. That was great, Sam. And it, 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 what you just triggered for me and connected back to Lauren is it, it doesn't matter if I put a million facts in front of you, you have to seek, want to know the truth. You have, and if you don't want to know the truth, it does not matter how many facts I put in front of you, right? So a big part of this is not only, this is April to your point, and Jerry, I see your hand there, is, is not, is to go is to teach people it's not just a platform where all the information is aggregated it's how do you actually think right how do you become a critical thinker how do you actually how do you not need censorship because you are your own censor and you have the tools and the skills to know what's right um Jerry, go ahead so a couple of things in front of me i was waving goodbye to philip who just dropped off that oh I had to drop off because um, he'd mentioned in the chat that he had to drop off but but I, I do want to do with, I want to do a little screen sharing here just to because a few things were uh, just got said that really um, fit where we're trying to go. So um, hope you all can see my brain now. Uh, and I've sent us to a thought called "We are in a Titanic battle over the narratives in our heads that we've always been in." Like this this is this is one of the ways that I express what civilization kind of is about is that. There's always kind of warring factions over the scripts in our heads. These are religions, these are political parties, these are philosophers, these are everybody. 
Uh, and so I have this, this notion that's important to me that we have scripts running in our minds and we're, we're unaware of most of the narratives that we have in our heads. Like most people don't know 80% of the scripts in their heads. And one interesting question would be, uh, how do we externalize that? How, we, how do we become more aware of the scripts that are in each of our heads, just individually and then discuss them together? That's an interesting thing. Um, we were just talking about how ideas conquer the world. And I've got a whole bunch of things in here about how ideas conquer the world. Uh, extremist opinions help move the needle in their direction, social change, here's some successful memes. Uh, but then I wanted to go back toward OGM and why we're here. And so I've been collecting up in my brain what I call OGM neighbor communities. Each of these, uh, GitLab, Hypernote, uh, a, a guy who, who does interviews and calls them Let's Chat. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll just click on this one. Uh, there's a fellow, da, da, da. I've not met him, but I support him on Patreon. Uh, his name is Ty Wells. And he sits down outside of conservative conventions and churches and malls and says, hey, I'd like to chat. And then he asks, he's a rhetorician. So he asks people questions and sort of tries to understand what they're saying. Really interesting. So I've been collecting a series of these neighbor communities, all of which are doing OGM related work, may not know about the other ones. So partly um, when I describe OGM in our, in our early conversations, I've been using ecological metaphors like Open Global Mind is meant to be an estuary, and an estuary is where fresh water meets salt. It's an estuary is a very nutrition rich zone. It's an innovation rich zone. Um, a lot of interesting things happen in estuaries. There are breeding grounds and, and so forth. So how might we create a container? That, so OGM is not meant to be like a new platform, the next LinkedIn or Facebook. OGM is meant to be uh, a connecting place for a series of platforms and containers uh, that are distributed where we can have the kinds of heartfelt connection that we've been talking about here that Sam brought up that many of you have brought up because those are kind of primary that we're not we're not going to logic or science our way out of this until we understand each other and are willing to listen to any kind of logic or science and that requires accepting one another in ways that we're not not doing very much right now and I can go deep into it I think that people who are really uh, smart about social psychology and personal psychology have weaponized trust and connectedness and are intentionally driving us apart because it wins political battles. So, um, and then all of that, if you can set that aside a little bit, we would also like OGM to be a really fruitful place for companies to come in and do better decision-making themselves because they have a better memory, because they have access to better data, because maybe because they're in a trustworthy conversation with outside stakeholders they weren't talking to before. And the platform allows them to have that conversation and instead of swooping in and doing something, actually doing it in a considered way, for example. So, so OGM at some point will host commercial projects uh, and may also host new trades. Uh, we mentioned earlier the idea of story threading. I'd be thrilled if just like today, if you wanted to hire a graphic facilitator or a graphic recorder, I know a bunch of people you could go uh, hire to do that. What if in a couple of years you could hire a story threader to bring into a meeting? And I haven't really explained the concept of story threading yet, but I'm trying to give a couple different um, perspectives on the elephant because in, in some sense, we are all like blind people looking at the elephant and it looks like a rope, it looks like a wall, uh, whatever it is. It's kind of meant to be a, a syncretistic blend of a series of these things. It's meant to be a place where people from different communities trying to solve the world's problems. Uh, there's one, a community called Game B, for example, where they're like, Game A is broken, what's Game B? There's transition towns, there's hundreds of these communities. Can we offer something of value to them that helps move everybody toward uh, better decisions, better understanding of one another? That's kind of the, mm. a piece of the, of the crux here of what OGM would like to be. So I, I want you guys to ask questions. I have a bunch of questions, but I've asked them already. Matt and, Matt and Jerry are tired of answering my questions. So, and Richard, I was, I'm glad you raised your hand because I knew I was going to see if we were keeping you awake out there. Um, no, I've, I've, got a bun yeah, I've got a bunch of fragmented thoughts. Um, so I'm not Zero. sure they're going to make too much sense. So, I mean, I know most of you are based in, the Amer in America. And so obviously the pursuit of happiness means something significant to you guys. Um, but we've had a conversation about um, uniting, yeah, everybody apologizing for the, the, the pain that everybody's caused. Um, you can't socialize pain. Everybody's pain is, is individual to them. And if you're sort of saying, oh, you know, we caused you pain and then we caused you, other, other groups, identity groups can say, well, what about our pain? 
why are you apologizing to their pain and, and you're not apologizing for our pain and and that's you know, that that's significant i think we can we can socialize happiness and we can socialize joy and we can socialize bliss but one of the big challenges is it's always socializing in pain and and everybody's pain is individual to them and it divides so that that's sort of the first um thing that came into my head um, the second thing, weirdly, is Chloe Ting's ab challenge, which I don't know if anyone has seen Chloe. She's a, girl, a Chinese Australian girl who's been sending videos out, uh, helping people work out during lockdown. Um, so I've, I've been locked down way longer than you have in Hong Kong. We started and my gym was closed for five months. So I started, uh, so Jill does her videos. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I sort of started following her and, and all of the people who've done her videos, this is people from all over the world are prefacing the videos and saying that I'm just doing this because I'm, I'm not fit, but you know, please be happy with your body. Please be happy with your life. We love you all. We, you know, you should be happy. So there's this really nice message coming out of this mixed race girl in Australia, sort of really helping the world. I thought that it's really quite a powerful thing. And then the, the final thing that I was thinking about, so I don't know if anyone's read any of Simon Weston's stuff on critical leadership. So he, he's arguing at the moment, we're seeing, um, two different leadership discourses rise. The first one, which is the one you're all talking about, which he calls eco-leadership or ecosystem leadership, um, which is this ability, so I've just written some notes so I can remember. So social purpose, participative organization and ecosystem mindset, they're his three components. But at the same time, you're getting a rebirth of scientific management within the, the digital systems. So mm. you're actually getting, you know, what you're seeing is knowledge workers getting treated like the, the, the manual workers were 120 years ago. And that either, you know, that, that's the battle we're fighting because if we actually start people treating people who are being paid to think like they can't think, then how on earth are we going to get people to think critically again? So they're the three things that have sort of been going through my very tired head while you've been talking. And I hope they were useful. <laughs> they're great. They are. They are fantastic. I mean, this is we just. This is perfect. I just uh, and Matt, I don't know if you raised your hand or not, or if you were jazzing anything, but I wanted to welcome, uh, great, uh, Jill Marie, and uh, I have James, maybe Jim. Where? Welcome, guys. Uh, we won't go through the full introduction, but it's really great to have you here and. Please feel free to jump in or ask a question. We're using chat. That's a good way to use questions as well. Um, I don't know. I sort of want to call on you because I just know that like there's so, there's so much genius that has not been spoken right now. And so I, I don't know. Uh, and the chat is amazing. It's, it's almost to the point of like, I wish there, I had two brains. Um, hmm. Peter Van, what are you thinking right now? I'm going to put you on the spot just because you're right there in my top right little Brady Bunch view. Uh, it's also fragmented thoughts. Um, so I, I think we ha we have been discussing what uh, Anne Anne Pendleton calls in her Systems of Action in her book the vehicle, which so OGM is the vehicle, but what's what's the the vision? So. Uh, uh, I really like the book that Anne and John C.D. Brown have written. I'm really emerged in it um, because it talks about, uh, I mean, the, the title is Designing for Emergence in a White Water World. Yeah. And there are some tools there, how you can create uh, agency or agency or acting in the world with impact. That's how I, I, I read it. So uh, uh, their big point is you can design for, um, you can design for action. So it's not only about responses to something. So we have been discussing responses to a number of things, but you can design for certain responses. So that's one fragment of thought. So I think there is a lot there in, especially in the chapter about systems of action or for action which gives a nice breakdown in vision. What is the vehicle? What is the concept? What is the, the network of supporting partners? And so there are five, five categories how you can organize a system for action because that's, I think, what we are trying to do. You just have to define for what yeah. to achieve what.
part. Yeah? Yeah. So my uh, suggestion in the, for what goes into the direction of, uh, I wrote something down, maybe it falls apart when I talk about it, but I wrote a learning platform for skipped learning. So what do I mean by skipped learning? Um, in, in Kenya, they have launched a payment system called M-Pesa and they didn't build on the existing infrastructure because there wasn't any. So they basically built M-Pesa payment system straight on top of uh, a basic mobile phone system. And it was a huge success. So they just skipped uh, something that everybody else went through. So here, we are discussing how can I present my ideas to somebody else and how can I organize a conversation with that somebody else who share with, with me their points of view and their context. And so we understand each other better and maybe then something beautiful comes out, 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 of, out of that. But what if you would design for uh, skip learning? So instead of trying to discuss A or B, that we teach learn people through a system of action, how they can just jump to the next phase. That would be um, possibly interesting. I wrote some other things like, but I think it was mentioned already, collective sense making. Uh, or another, I mean, we are using too many difficult words. <laughs> so if we want to sell it or present it to other people, we have to use words like the Wikipedia for, I don't know what, for, for brains. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Matt, you want to talk about, sorry, Peter, thank you so much. And, and maybe just there's a, I know Matt has something that can sort of layer on and, the and last obviously, thing uh, and, and I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Can well, it, actually, Ann, and you had your hand up first. I mean, Matt, talking about the sensing and the sense making change making, we can get to, but Ann would love your thoughts as well, since we just talked about your book. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it was funny. I had my hand up um, before you even say anything, Peter. But the the thing that seems has become more and more apparent to me, there's a Joshua Cooper Ramos has this great thing, and Joshua works for Kissinger, who's so he's part of Kissinger's whole advisory think tank. And, and he talks about, so I, for me, the white water world is just this notion that we're more hyper connected than ever before. So all of our problems are this is entanglement from everything being connected. COVID wouldn't come across the sea even 30 years ago, right? So it's this hyper connectivity that's changed everything. And Raymond says, um, you know, that we something like we need to have the ability to look at any object and see the way in which it's changed by connection whether you're commanding an army or running a fortune 500 company planning a great work of art or even thinking about education it's this notion of seeing how everything is changed by connection and then john and i disaggregate seeing into two cognitive functions one being is to see for understanding in other words to see to literally see and what i love about the brain is you're seeing entanglement, you're seeing connections. There are other very powerful tools. So my work really is the intersection of architecture as a radically multidisciplinary practice, complexity science. So I love your beautiful estuary. I use the ecotone, Jerry, um, you know, complexity science and all of these really powerful new tools we have. So part of the seeing for understanding is something like the brain, but we have causal diagrams, we have network analysis, we have social data mining, we have so many amazing tools to see connections that we could not see before. But even more important than Jerry held up the other book is, or, or chapter 19, is that seeing is also about imagining. And literally, the imagination, which is really, really different than creativity, it's an intercognitive process. It happens in our brain in a split second. And it's the way we put images together back to where we started. Images in our brain that come from how we see the world, experiences we've had, ways we put things together and how we bank it. So it's based upon our stories. And so this notion, and we talk about how imagination is not just something for the, the aesthetic 
in the sense of art experimentation, but imagination is with us for every a moment of perception that we have as well. And so how do we begin to create practices where people move themselves from using imagination every day to a more, a more expansive or widened aperture around everything. So I'm getting to really the heart of the matter why I'm so fascinated by this project is if we can begin to build something that helps us see connections more and not just simple connections, but, but multiple layers of connections in a way that we can make sense of them, not just as a grab bag. And then if we can use it to collectively imagine and for imagining, you have to be able to speculate on what ifs, on things that you normally wouldn't enter. And this is what we use to solve which problems. This is what I'm doing studios on this stuff. How do we collectively imagine better futures, desirable futures, not just default futures? So how do we use stories to, I love this, stories that project our meaning on the world to understand how we see it. But how do we collectively create speculative stories? that is that desired object that someone else talked about, right? And trust often comes from going after the same desire, even though you may not trust people yet in terms of their specifics, but you trust the endeavor and it links people together. I probably talk too much, but for me, that's everything. It's the notion of seeing how everything's changed. That was great, Anne, thank you. That was great. Uh, Sam, you had your hand up. And then Lauren, how about you go after Sam? One of the difficult things about these kind of group conversations is because as ideas pile up on the uh, stack, to go back to something previously said kind of disrupts the flow. So I apologize for that uh, right away. But one of the things I was uh, hoping we could see is if we're in the practice of exploring a tool or mechanism or platform or something, in my experience, it's been most helpful and most evolutionary to apply it at the same time. That way you learn by application, you actually evolve the capability through the application. We're able to do and make impact, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later. And clearly the impact of the times today is what you read on every social media platform today. I bet you there's only two things that are in my, 90% 90, 90 of my traffic is about two topics these days. And even that first one, which was big a couple of weeks ago, is less than the one that's just emerged in the last couple of weeks, I guess. Obviously, I'm referring to uh, Black Lives Matter and to uh, COVID. So I'm hoping this is not controversial, but I'm hoping that the next session or sometime soon, at least three of us can bring one of our very close uh, colleagues you know, in some of those communities. I'd like to see uh, that voice represented, I'd like to see the indigenous voice represented. I'd like to get those perspectives, you know, threaded into our stories here. So that was idea number one. The idea number two, which alludes back to my, I'll stop soon, okay, which alludes back to my previous note about it taking time to build trust, is that we're each, and I say this with no sarcasm, no, no sense of humor, we're each extremely smart people. We're each extremely well-meaning people. We each probably are 150% overbooked already with our time because we've got so many ideas and so many good thoughts and we've you know studied this in depth. So what I'm hoping we can do as a step towards that trust is to mutually learn about what each of us is already doing and how that is progressing and keep that you know kind of in mind as we explore what we could potentially be doing together. Because I think that exploring what we do together, in my estimation, takes much longer than we think we than we think it's going to take. Okay. And then the third thing, which is this this word I like to just introduce since it's just five seconds, is the co-visioning word. The co-visioning is what we're really trying to do with uh, GCC, the Global Challenges uh, Collaboration. And so that is top, you know, one of the top six notions. The other one, by the way, just as a teaser, is coexistence. And then I'll leave the other four for later. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Sam. All right. So lots of interest, guys. Let me know. But I'm, so Lauren and then Matt and then Charles. It's, and I know it is hard to keep a thread going, but we'll do the best we can. We're powering on. Let's hear, for, let's hear it, Lauren. 
Well, the, what I'm saying actually comes out of many conversations with Sam. So it's good that I'm just going after him. And Perfect. one of the things that Sam told me is that what happens if we want this open global mind is uh, in the past, a bunch of technologists has gotten together and then the conversations are all about how do we do it? What tech do we use? We do it this way. No, we do it that way. And then no one ever actually builds anything. So a completely opposite and maybe more effective way to start is actually to start building that kind of ad campaign before you have the tech and know how to do it, you know, create like an amazing vision of what it could be. Even if we're not there, we don't have the tech to do it, to focus on like amazing display so that people are like, yes, that is what we need. That's great. Yep. And that back to Peter, right? What are you going to do with it? Right. And sell that. Matt. Yeah. Hamilton, maybe, yeah, maybe I can jump in here because, um, and I love this conversation. And the thing that it gets me excited is it's reminiscent of some of the early feelings um, and engagement that Jerry and I were having. And we have been thinking though, about like, how do you get this thing started? And mm -hmm a lot of the commentary that you guys have made really fall into at least our current thinking. And we, you know, uh, at least my point of view here is that we need to be working on multiple fronts simultaneously. And so um, if you think about the technical layer front, our strategy right now, and this is a, I'd love to get some feedback here, is let's take every available tool to us that exists today and just use them and appropriate them into our purpose and start to knit them, knit them together, right? So the open global mind, it already exists. It just, we haven't put name to it. So that's, that's one piece. And then as we start using those things and we start connecting them, we may discover um, what the leaps of capability that we wanna, we wanna put out there. Um, going, uh, Lauren, to your comment, I think there's an engagement layer here. We have to start talking about this and dreaming about this and imagining it um, and writing our own version of fiction and bringing that to life in the world so that we get clear and other people get excited about that. And so I think that there's something, something there. Um, we've talked also about um, building on top of this a services layer. So how do we, if we don't put this into use, we're not gonna know what we need it for. Um, and I'm in the process of right now selling uh, OGM, if you will, to one of my clients. Um, it's a great place. It's a corporate client. We can um, hopefully provide them with um, some value, but also to help them build, uh, help use their interest and their resources to help build this, you know, build this capability. And so I think there are different services we can build on top of this and, you know, ready to go, as well as looking at maybe their social problems we want to tackle. But we may be light years ahead of being able to really do anything in that space more sophisticated than um, other people are doing because we, we're just not there yet with, our, with you know, what this thing is. And then I think we need you know, this think dream space where, we're, where, where, there is the where we are creating the estuary and what does that look like? And then, and, and then the finally, we've talked about the, the governance, the rules, what are, the, what are the flocking rules that are going to allow us to interact with each other and, can, and, and sort of get this going? And I, you know, so as we've thought about it, that's kind of where we are in terms of different domains of thrust. And Jerry, I know you want to jump in here, but I do think we need to get what we're, what we're inviting all of you in, and maybe you're 150% capacitized and maybe want to be a lurker. But what we really want to do is to start to connect the energies that we're already doing and take that 150% and not divert it from, from that to, some, to this, but to connect it so that we're all starting to build toward that co-vision uh, space. And I'm um, kind of interested, Sam, in hearing more about that. So Jerry, I know you want to layer in on this. Um, yeah, and um, pretty much exactly what you're saying. And I just want to uh, share a place in my brain where I've taken notes about this. These are, and this, there's too many questions here, but the divide and conquer approach, because this is a pretty large, ambitious 
kind of vision to say, hey, let's let's try to bring together all these different projects. But there are a lot of people who are doing really great work. So let's let's get them more attention and let's let's enable them to sort of connect up. So, uh, for example, you know, how can OGM be relevant and useful right now? Uh, right? What does OGM look like to the outside world? Um, what is our massive transformational purpose if we're going to do something like that? But maybe also, what is the plausible promise that attracts uh, participants to OGM? What like when Linus Torvalds creates Linux, um, he says, hey, everybody, um, I'd like to make a version, an open version of, of Unix that runs on my PC. And the plausible promise is anybody who comes in and collaborates to this will get to use it forever because I'm putting it under this GNU public license, et cetera, et cetera. So what is our plausible promise? But partly I'm interested in how can we dissolve into small sub conversations? Some of us are architects and builders and know a lot about technology and what to use. Others are actually um, really aware of somatic or philosophical or interactive uh, spaces. How can we go tackle some of these different kinds of issues and report back to each other in some pretty easy way to digest so that there's no way that all of us can actually be in all these conversations. I'm wondering how I'm going to participate in as many of these conversations as need to happen. Um, so for example, uh, under philosophical questions OGM raises are a bunch of sub questions, right? How can the spirit and the business of OGM be in harmony? How do we avoid OGM becoming a big debate circle? How do we stay on, you know, how do we actually get things done? Uh, how do we keep OGM as open as possible? What does that mean? Uh, because there will be some proprietary projects that happen in here or people who want to participate who don't want to be public about it or whatever. Um, how do we keep OGM from being overrun by idea peddlers? Um, how do we manage intellectual property in here? Because we're trying to be as open as possible. These are all uh, really interesting questions that are, you know, will come up immediately. Uh, because we are talking about um, how ideas have sex and uh, how people curate those ideas and plant them in other people's heads, right? That, that's a, a big piece of this. And some of those ideas are, are rooted very, very deeply. So part of what um, I think, and, and maybe I'm jumping ahead too far, Hamilton, to the, the now what part of it, but I'd love to figure out what are, the, what are the big buckets of questions that have traction or interest here and how might we then convene into those conversations and report back uh, to figure out what it is we are um, doing together. So, Jerry, I think that's great, and I'm and I'm looking at time. Twenty four minutes left. Um, I think it. I think let's do that. Where do we go next? Could you guys? And one of you did talk about the roles, the early role definitions that we have started to come up with. Um, can I? Can I just? I I had my hand up before, and I just. Wanted, oh, sorry, Charles. Yeah, sorry, I wanted sorry. To quickly share. Um, you know, sort of. It's been repeatedly uh, a theme and a pattern here about co-visioning. Um, and I just want to check, is it, do I have um, ability to screen share? Sure. Uh, okay, cool. So when I hit the button, it'll be fine. Um, so in regard to Tom Atley, and actually Sam, Sam Hans um, called to, to this co-visioning. Um, so Tom Atley wrote a blog. I put the link sort of far up above in the chat here. Um, I can show that for a moment also on the screen share. It's called Seeing Together or COVID. So We're it's not in seeing your screen yet. I think. Uh... I, I, will, I, will, I will just in okay. a moment. I'm just this is my tiny preamble. It's a, it's a nano preamble to a nano screen share here. I know time is precious. Um, so just Tom Atley on the 21st of March put a blog um, uh, called COVID or Seeing Together. So it's even in the name of COVID. Um, and isn't that fascinating? So, and all this collective sense making was also a theme and a pattern I'm hearing again and again. I'm going to share in silence actually when I share uh, Tom's images. There's three maps basically that we just received last week. That's Lauren and, and I at the uh, Kiko Lab. Um, and I'm not, it's not my story. So it's Tom's story to come in hopefully directly or indirectly through us or, or whatever to talk about these things, but it's, they're, they're packed. And I think just for the record, because we're being recorded, then you, you have, you'll have them. And he, last thing um, in my little preamble is he wants to share these freely. He made that really clear. It's open source, they're for us and for everyone. Um, so let's uh, see what we can do here. Um, I'm gonna just even mute and I'm gonna screen share just for a, a, a tiny bit. Sorry, it says it's disabled, actually. Excuse oh, no. me. That may be a... Make him a co-host. Maybe that's what it is. Okay. Hey, uh, okay. Ken, sorry, Charles. While you're setting up here, Ken, I know you were going to say goodbye. Any any just last thoughts before you leave? Last words of wisdom before we lose you? Um, 
Well, one, thank you. It's been a, a pleasure to be here with everybody. And I, I know some of you, and I'm really looking forward to talking with others who I've just seen for the first time today. Um, Jerry knows this. I'm really um, always like, how does the body fit into this? What's the role of somatics? Because uh, the third domain that is just starting to be recognized as legitimate domain of learning is the somatic context of the body. Our nervous systems are our learning and organizing uh, a learning and organizing domain that is not very well integrated into the online world, um, which tends to be very cognitive centric. So, you know, how can we bring more somatic awareness into this? Um, uh, you know, I look at somatic, I look at gesture as a form of, of communication. So what are the appropriate gestures that we can integrate into open global mind um, that will enhance that intelligence? And I don't have any answers, but I'm, I'm really curious to question. explore that question. So uh, wow. thanks. That's amazing. That's awesome. Thanks, Ken. Have a great day. We'll see you next time. Um, Cheers, Ken. Wait, so yeah, again, just, just quickly now, I got, I got Tom's blog up here. The, the link's up in the chat somewhere. Um, I'm just going to mute and I'm going to switch over. There's three images. I'm going to try to just let them be recorded and then I'll, I'll stop sharing. Thanks. Awesome. And if I can just step in for a second and, and comment on what Charles just shared. Um, Tom Atley and the communities he's in are really profound thinkers and doers on the topics we care about. I just posted the, uh, uh, the pattern language that he's, uh, he's helped create. And here I'm reposting the link to the, to the post he just showed. But these diagrams we're seeing are the results of a whole bunch of work and thinking and compromise and research and so forth. And it's really hard to just sit and absorb these. And yet, I think part of our objective here is how do, how do we become permeable uh, sort of sponges and then coral reef-like connectors for these really great ideas and help them find their way to other places that don't know about these things that could use them in different ways. So I, I think that uh, when I showed the OGM neighbor communities uh, thought in my brain, some of those are open source tool building communities. Some of those are things like Tom Atlee's. Uh, some of those are projects to try to save the world uh, that are earnest and in some kind, sometimes aiming a little bit wrong. Um, how do we connect, absorb, filter, improve, and then from all of that, how do we build our own version of, of, this, of this platform so that we can express and storytell and remember things better with one another? I think that's a piece of our goal here. And quick, just a quick comment to tag on there in regard to Tom Atlee. Um, so his, um, there's kind of a parent, parent container called the Co-Intelligence Institute. It's not super active as an entity, but just as a, as a concept framework, um, co-intelligence. And then one of my big takeaways um, from several years back when I connected with Tom is the, the critical distinction between collective intelligence and collective wisdom. So really going for the wisdom is a very inspiring um, sort of guiding principle for Lauren and me in the Kiko lab. So. Yeah, that's great. So I think, I, I think it is time to, um, to get into where do we go from here and how can you guys contribute? There's just, and Matt mentioned this, I just wanna talk about domains and member roles. That, and these again are our early thinking. Um, we talked about the domains, again, the domains, there's an engagement layer. People can just sort of access OGM. There's a service layer where people can actually use it to do stuff with consulting, negotiation, mediation, whatever, imagination. Oh, actually there's a think dream space layer where there isn't an end goal, but it's just a place you can, a playground. Then there's the platform layer. And then there's the governance layer of how do you, the, we call the super organism stewardship because that makes it cooler t-shirt than governance. Um, so, you know, we think those are the layers there that need to be built. And obviously there's a lot of connection there. And in terms of roles, um, there's sort of five active roles that we see. One is the architects of this whole thing. I see all of this as architects in some way. They're the ones who, who hold the intent sacred and provide the leadership. 
There is there are the builders, the makers, the creators. We really struggled with uh, some lofty words and some simple words. These are the people who create the content, who develop the capabilities, who build the system, who make this what it is. Um, there's some minders. We like that word. We, we played around with that. The minders are the one who create, curate, connect, and express knowledge and beliefs, right? They're the, the sort of the data, the stocks, if you will, if you think of the stocks and flows analogy, but who are the people that are filling the stocks? And then two other, the patron, the patrons, we need people who are going to support this um, and invest in this. And the champions, the advocates, the ambassadors, the people who are going to spread the word and just know about this and realize the importance of this in the world. Um, the only other thing I'd say is that we, we hope that we have this idea that there could be a fellow role, that each of these roles that you could also have a fellow, which just means that you're just really dedicating part of yourself and your time to it and, you, and it's part of your being, OGM, and that there's this sort of fellows idea that we're talking about. Um, Matt, Jerry, would you guys like to layer anything else onto that before we start talking about how people can play and where do we go from here? Matt, you unmuted first, so you get to go yeah, first. Yeah, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I, um, I, well, I love to hear, you know, some questions about these, these roles, but I think the, we, we need a little bit of everything and we need people to show up the way that they can best show up um, and get organized. And I think that, um, the, the most important thing right now are, I think is at the level of that co-visioning architecture and we're using architecture and I think in a very um, uh, similar way that you use the term. Um, and, um, but we also need the builders and, and we need to be making things and pulling things together. You know, I might also suggest that, um, you know, these people who are connecting and drawing in more people into this conversation, um, is going to be really important, um, and, and maybe just my final re final reflection um, is that I imagine that we're all actually going to have to change who we are as people, how we process information, how we take in things, and and that's that's a that's a pretty audacious thing. And I haven't really thought about that until this this call that it's going to be transformative, even in the way that we as human beings just process and take in and make, make sense of our, of our world. Um, yeah. So let me pause. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go answer a question that Sam asked in the chat, which is, is, is OGM an income or revenue producing endeavor? Um, hmm. And there will be revenue streams involved in OGM of different kinds. Um, one of them is this, this fellow's uh, role that, that we're talking about. Um, some fellowships involve a stipend. At this point, OGM has no budget, but we'd like to create a bucket of money that would go to fellows so that um, as, pe as people sort of get, get made fellows in some sense, because they've contributed an awful lot to OGM, um, they could maybe make a living doing that. They could, you know, uh, offset their costs, et cetera. Um, there will also be commercial projects living on top of OGM, which may pay a fee for services by people who are trained in new functions uh, or for using the platform. They may also be inspired to donate some money uh, into the, the creation of OGM in some way. So uh, one of the big buckets of questions right now is, what is our organizational structure? What should it be? Should we be a public benefit corporation? And if so, uh, organized in what way? Who has done this well before us? What role models are out there to do this with? Um, how do we balance? And there's a lot of open source projects where there's a foundation that holds the open source code and then there's a commercial entity that basically sells services against it. That's interesting, but I'm not sure we're exactly that. So I think there's a super interesting conversation for how can we host commercial endeavors that people can make a living from as well as be incredibly open and donate the, the, the contents of our work, this thing we're curating together um, into uh, the, the, the commons because one of our sort of grounding beliefs is the commons actually matters. That, that the metaphoric equivalent of fertile soil is really important to civilization ongoing. Uh, and we'd like to create an ethos to do that. And the more that that ethos and that way of seeing can be contagious to large multinationals that end up using the platform, the better. I mean, that, that's a, a piece of what might happen here is that, is that we form a way of seeing and a way of working together um, around ideas and memory and analysis and storytelling and all of that that many people find useful and they're like, well, damn, we, we want to be more like that. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a piece of it. Sam, does that yeah. probably address your question? And it, 
and along those lines, Jerry, I do think that we might need our own economy, right? We might need to think about that as how we exchange value amongst uh, about intra membership, um, as well as ways of creating services on the outside that we can draw in resources into that economy. Um, so Sam, please. Sam and then Charles. Yep. Yeah. yeah. This is definitely one of those questions that uh, many organizations have been attempting to create with other communities struggle with as well. And I say struggle because it's uh, often, you know, not the most favorite thing to talk about, but it is, is crucial. Um, I do think that how we show up uh, does depend on, you know, some of the answers to these questions. And we show up, I think, willingly trying to share as much as possible because there's a belief here that we're going to create something good. What I was working, and I'm struggling with here now, I'm using that word again, is in the immediacy scale between this week, this month, this quarter, this year, this decade, whatever, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what is the place where we want to establish that co-visioning, that action plan? Because, and what am I... brain farts around the new economy that we, I think I at least would like to see is to invert this, this notion of transactions as the carrier of value. I really think that's very artificial. It's very transitory. It's very meaningless, except for you know, some very predictable areas. And so rather than transaction, I'd rather think about valued connections and flow of goodwill, of ideas, of materials, of you know, care, of et cetera, okay? So that we can actually have this web, this network of value flow. And I know other contexts use that word as well, but I wanna use it here just you know, to say, I wanna have that notion. So that we're not taking individual transactions, assigning sing, you know, single numbers to them, forgetting them, going about our day. I'd rather see these rich networks where something I do maybe here or something somebody else does over there 25 years ago gets recognized. I mean, from now gets recognized or even two weeks from now gets recognized. And it wasn't apparent now, but maybe it's apparent later. And that that not be assigned the $5 that it was assigned initially, but that there's some kind of a dynamic web of value and flow. That's what I'd like to see. Rather than say, okay, if I've depleted my funds, too bad I'm out on the street. You know, that's not the social fabric that I'd like to see. So I don't know yet where to have that conversation in what temporal uh, context over. That's great. Thanks, Sam. Charles, what were you going to say? Uh, yeah, quick comment or kind of putting a, a question or even suggestion out there. The question was, was, was just up just, just before about sort of what type of entity, you know, whether it's public or private or maybe implying, you know, for-profit, non-profit, and I don't, I'm not hearing sort of as I'm listening with like kind of macro meta ears, um, you know, one, in, one entity here or even necessarily one platform, but that's another, another thing. So maybe that would just indicate like m multiple entities or a hybrid kind of, you know, weaving or intertwingling of the nonprofit for profit. Um, and definitely yes, plus however many uh, to new structures, new economy, currency, value flow. Thanks, over. Thank you. So guys, we're at eight minutes and I'm just going to say now we are past the point where we're not going to be able to hear from everybody. I worry, I worry. Um, but I do want to spend the last eight minutes hearing from you. I think that the team here, the Jerry and Hank and Matt and I are going to go back and sort of reach back out to you and figure out how you can continue to join. But I just want feedback from you guys before we, if you, if we did one thing right, as we start to push this off the dock, what would it be based on your experience? And Peter K, we have you know you've been doing some great chats. I don't know if you want to say something on how Shay, you've been Kevin. I know you had a point around are we defining this problem or, or trying to solve the problem? So any Bill, I didn't say all you. Last thoughts, just you know maybe efficiently, and we can try to get as many in as possible. Uh, on how did you just raise your hand? Nope, off the mute. On how then Shay. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I I loved really uh, attending the EXO world, uh, was hearing about that Arundhati Roy uh, quote, pandemic is a portal. It's a gateway between one world and the other. We are the mid very middle of the crossroad. And uh, 
open global mind can be a way to give light to uh, cross that gateway in the right way. And collective intelligence, and making the most of collective intelligence or collective wisdom is the way. People and big corporations need to have light to determine what's going on in the future. They are absolutely lost nowadays. <laughs> just thinking on the, on, on the balance, on the PNL, on the disaster of, of this, uh, of the consequences of this, of, of this um, COVID uh, outbreak. But they, they need to be accompanied. Before the pandemic, they all were aware, in my opinion, in, in a cosmetic way, about sustainable development, development goals or about global grand challenges. Now, it's absolutely clear that they have to embrace those principles if they want to recreate not only their future, but the future of all the humanity. And open global mind can be as a, as, as a, as a dream tank, the facilitator of, of those new pathways. <laughs> I oh, know you're so hired. <laughs> you're a marketing person. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. You're Shay, you, did you have your hand up? Yeah, Shay. Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, Richard. I don't know if this is the right moment for this or not. Um, but you know, you you three obviously have ideas about how people come and engage and flow through what you're trying to build here. And this conversation has been incredibly fruitful. You know, we've touched all over the place. But um, going forward as a next step, and maybe I'm the only one, but you know, maybe just ask around. Having some flows would be interesting just as uh, to engage, bring out the comments from people. You know, how does this flow work? Um, how does this uh, pull people in? You know, how does this create the network, et cetera, et cetera. And that might be a good way to help create a little more structure in people's minds for um, what, uh, what this thing is, right? Because we, we're talking platform, we're talking about connector, we're talking about all these things, but it's, it's, it's very sort of, um, esoteric at the it's moment. It's nebulous. It's an Epstein yeah. drive. It totally is. Exactly. Uh, yes. Right. So yeah. just maybe having something and if, if just for conversation sake, just something on the screen to say, okay, what do we think about these flows that might be helpful. That's great. Yeah. Show. And Thank I think you. that's one part of that architecture architect Thing that we need to do is we need help. We need help, quite honestly, building those flows. And yeah. um, you know, part of our challenge is that because this idea is so big, um, with the limited amount of time that we have, it um, we need more. We need more horsepower um, put in shape to this, and we need to figure out how to collaborate at a at a bigger scale. So I appreciate yeah. that idea of the of the flow. Richard, um, you you had your hand up, and then Jerry. I don't know unless Jerry. Did yeah, I mean, I'm just um, because I'm the only one in Asia. I just wanted to sort of bring a little slightly Asia, Asian perspective to this. So one of one of the things I think you'll you'll be it's probably a tactic you can help use as well because over here we're we're looking at what's going on in Europe and the States, and and for us it's the, the complete collapse of I of a leadership system. Um, you know, because everything here was nowhere near other than the Chinese the original Chinese outbreak. Nothing here was as bad. Um, so, so you've got a tactic there, I think, perhaps to say, well, okay, yes, we accept that, and and here's a, here's an alternative that that sort of is underneath the radar that we can play around with. Um, but you've you've also got the over here again the, the the fact that of what's happened in Black Lives Matter, given the Hong Kong protests. Yeah, again, it's just delish. It's it's made everything America's saying about. The, the the east delegitimized i mean it, it really has because we've had we had eight months of protests and nothing compared to what you've had in two weeks so just tactically that's something to think about in terms of trying to get uh, the people on this side of the world to to listen to what you're trying to do great that's amazing perspective richard thank you for that um got some jazz hands there yeah kevin um I, I, want to, I don't want to put you on the spot, but like, I just would love to hear from you because you've been sort of putting some questions in here and just any sort of closing thoughts from you? 
Um, yeah, uh, white dudes go last, so that's why I haven't been talking. So, <laughs> yes, if at all. Um, what else, guys? Like, who? Who? Um, any other thoughts? Or any other like questions? I mean, Shay, the idea of flows is like, it's so right on, right? And I mean, that's such a nice little gem of how we start thinking about structuring work and dialogues and conversations. But what else, guys? April, you went off mute. Just really briefly. I mean, it came up on. Um the chat much earlier, but I brought up and others echoed it, um, just this notion of age. And um, I don't think it relates necessarily to this call today, but like, as we think about this genera generationally, um, it's less about business model structure. It's more about how this could be um, not just pitched, but like the value we're really going after here, where I think for many of us as adults, um, we are already, even, I mean, this is incredibly generative and all of us are excited about perhaps shifting our brains and how they work. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be a much bigger lift for any of us. Um, I don't think we can't do it. I just think, it, it, and we are obviously in positions of greater leadership power, whatever it may be, but how do we frame this in a way that I just look at this and think, gosh, if, a, if in a generation or less, we could actually have a, sh a, a generational shift towards this. And so I guess I just want to offer that up. I, I get that it's like adding more complexity to what is already an incredibly complex Petri dish, but it feels to me that that's where there would be, that's where you'll see a, a, a tipping point reach. That's where you'll see a kind of critical mass. And, and I do think there is hunger amongst younger individuals, the younger generation, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's a hunger there and there's a waking up um that is happening in a way i don't think we've seen in quite some time so how do we yeah. how do we fold that in yeah i mean i this is a movement right not to get too grandiose right but it's more than a platform it's like we're really trying to just sort of change the way people think and live and interact and connect and make decisions and i don't know maybe we're shooting too high but i think it is a tool but i think it's got to be more than that right there's got to be a whole philosophy behind it and movement behind it Jerry and Matt, and we get, we're, end, oh, we'll, April, real quick, because we're over time. So we're real quick, time. and then Jerry and Matt. So go ahead, to that April, end. I was just going to say, you know, I, I hadn't thought about it in this way, but when it comes to what we're designing, design, baking in the feedback, younger feedback into the design itself, this is a good time for that. Sorry. And thank you all. Thank you. Um, I want to address uh, Shay's question about flows in, in a couple ways, which may actually not be answering her question, I'm not sure. But uh, one really simple thing, we have a Google group conversational list for OGM. Uh, anybody, I'm going to invite everybody to be on it. That's a place where we can begin a flow. I have this idea, this is just me thinking through how this might work, that we could then define a few clusters of things that need to be talked about, like organizational structure, uh, membership, what does this look like, how does it work, revenue models, whatever, that, maybe that's a cluster, and that that one might go off and, and have its own conversation someplace that is visible to everybody else, whoever wants to go check in. There might be a bunch of techie geeks who want to go talk about distributed objects and self-sovereign identity and whatever other kinds of kinds of infrastructural topics might make sense. They might have the conversation on Stack Exchange or on Reddit, where other people already doing these kinds of things are having those conversations and where they can sort of interact and involve with projects that are already solving some of those problems. Or, or, or that conversation might be held on a highly fruitful list that's 80% that's done with some of those questions. And, and so for me, it's, it's like some, we need a place to keep the map of which conversation is happening where, but I'm not sure that we don't, we, we're going to all drown if we try to be in all those conversations. So let's find our way to those. So the other part of the flow is I'm trying to design onto the OGM website. If you go to opengoldmine.com, there's a fledgling website we sent you a link to. But I'm trying to design a, basically a sorting hat. Uh, several of us like to borrow the Harry Potter notion of like you put on this hat and it tells you you're a Slytherin or a Gryffindor or a Hufflepuff. Like um, how do we help people find their way into uh, A, their role uh, through their superpowers and B, their interest areas. And the, the, the better and quicker we can do that while then creating these loops, these flows that come back from each of the conversations into a place where we can say, oh, okay, um, this is the current group and this is, you know, these are the burning questions. And sorry, Hamilton, I took so long, but I want to right. explain this. No, that's me. great. Makes and, sense? And yes, I think it does. And I think there's definitely a huge follow-up from us. Lauren, I know you have a point. You're actually going to close this down because I know everyone has to go. And I think this, there may be other people who jump on the Zoom call that we don't want to join. But anyway, 
close us down, Lauren. And thank you guys so much before we hear from you. Lauren. Well, I'm a person of action. So I think that the easiest way to go forward and actually get something done is to do what Ed Saperia and Nathan did with the, I think it's kind of like the end COVID thing. I think that's what it's called. Um, and they just started a word document and people can, uh, uh, they, they basically did the titling, which Jerry has already done. Um, all the, basically Jerry has all the, the, what's it called? The, the content page, the, uh, what's Index? it called? Like the first uh, page table, in the book that contents? lists everything. Contents. Table yeah. contents. Index? Yeah. Just send out a word document with the table of contents and everyone can just upload, um, like references to who's doing that. And that would be a great way to start this. So part of what we're trying to solve for is the 4 million Google spreadsheets and Google Docs that are already out there about COVID or about whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and what I hope is that in a few years, I can migrate out of the brain and into an OGM platform that does what you just said, but in a shared distributed way. So let's put up mm -hmm. some temporary documents that help us share things back and forth, in particular group status, you know, conversational status. But, but I'm, I'm trying to not have one long document that has a whole bunch of really nice links in it because I, that, that, yeah. that turns out to be like drowning material for me at least. I don't know about anybody else. So um, one of the flows that we'll yeah. have to create is, is on this. And I saw Sam recommend a Mattermost. There's something coming here. Um, Mattermost and, is and, a Slack replacement. It's an open source Slack replacement. Yeah, so um, I think this is a good point to call this conversation. I think what makes me excited is that there is energy to keep this going beyond this call. Um, I would just say two things in closing, um, just on behalf of the OGM team, thank you guys so, so much. Like it is, it is humbling that you guys came to this and that you really poured your soul into it. Like I feel it, so thank you so much. Um, back to patience, Judy, this might not apply to you. Just kidding. Um, give it, have a little patience so that we can digest this, that we can maybe start up some initial flow, some initial clusters and just make it easy to re-engage you guys. A lot to ponder. Um, but we definitely, 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 definitely will re-engage you guys. We want you to be a part of this. And um, I'm so excited. So thank you guys. Yeah. And now all you guys know each other. So uh, start connecting and uh, let's go change the world. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Stay healthy and happy, everybody. Enjoy Thanks, summer. Everyone. Thanks for assembling like such great people. This is amazing. How did you do this? Humans. Very. We trust humans. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Mike and Olga, nice meeting Thank you guys. Bye, everyone. You too, Dave Howard. Bye. All right, see you Bye. guys. See you, Peter.